Last time on Journey to the West, a devastating duel of doppelgangers drew dangerous delinquency as a duo of deadly, uh, monkeys, yeah, battled their way through the far corners of the world, shaking the very foundations of the heavens with their ferocious and terrifying strength. Unable to distinguish the deceit in the dreadful duo, yes, we're back in it, Tripitaka was forced to rely on the aid of the Buddha himself, who concluded that the counterfeit Sergopithecoid, bit of a stretch, was none other than the near-omniscient six-eared macaque, one of the four heavenly apes that categorize our clever Sun Wukong, a concept that definitely didn't come out of absolutely nowhere. After defeating his dark reflection, Sun Wukong rejoined his companions and they once again continued their journey to the west. So our heroes are trekking westward and the seasons have turned onward, carrying our intrepid heroes into the cool autumn months. Or at least it's supposed to, but Tripitaka notes that the climate seems unusually warm for that time of year and it's getting downright toasty to a rather alarming degree. But I wouldn't know anything about what that feels like. They roll up on a local village to ask about the bizarre and confusing weather and are informed that they're coming up on the Mountain of Flames, a massive permanent fixture of the environment that's constantly wreathed in unimaginably hot fire, cooking the land around it for a full 60 miles in every direction. Sun Wukong commits the faux pas of pondering a logical world-building question in a fantastical allegory for the journey to enlightenment and asks the locals how they can possibly grow the crops needed to eat if they're living in a permanent summer. And they tell him that once every 10 years, they bring a sacrifice of livestock and fine foods to the immortal Iron Fan who lives in the faraway Jade Cloud Mountain. And the immortal Iron Fan uses a magical palm leaf fan to temporarily quench the flames and bring rain, allowing the locals a semblance of normal farming conditions for at least a little while. This arrangement has worked out pretty well for them so far, but unfortunately the Mountain of Flames is, no surprise, set squarely on the road to the west, and it's much too hot for most of our heroes to survive the journey. So Sun Wukong hops on a cloud and sails off to the Jade Cloud Mountain to see about getting that palm leaf fan and putting the fire out for good. When Sun Wukong reaches the mountain, he's informed by a local woodcutter that they haven't heard of any immortal Iron Fan, they just have a princess Iron Fan. But they mostly call her Rakshasi, due to her much more relevant status as the wife of the powerful and terrifying Bull Demon King. Uh-oh, that's a name Sun Wukong is very familiar with. After all, the Bull Demon King's son, Red Boy, nearly ate Tripitaka a few episodes ago, and getting him put in the Kuan Yin internship timeout zone has already pissed off one of his relatives bad enough to attack the Monkey King on sight. But hey, maybe his parents aren't holding a grudge right? Anything is possible. So Sun Wukong reinvigorates his sense of sunny optimism and scoots off to the mountain cave to announce his presence. Unfortunately, when Princess Iron Fan learns her mountain has been graced by the legendary Sun Wukong, she flies into an immediate rage, armors up, and stalks out to face him. Sun initially plays dumb about the whole Red Boy debacle, but does point out that any hijinks he may or may not have done would have been heavily justified by how her baby boy tried to eat his master. And besides, Red Boy's Kuan Yin summer job has bumped him up in the world by granting him the true immortality of Buddhism. This incidental reminder that she can't visit him anymore, tips Princess Iron Fan over the edge into true fury and she attacks. Sun lets her get it out of her system by tanking a few hits, and when she realizes her swords aren't making a dent, they escalate into a furious battle that lasts all the way to sunset. And when Princess Iron Fan finally realizes she can't beat him, she pulls out the legendary fan itself, but instead of handing it over, she swings it, blowing Sun Wukong clear over the horizon and leaving her free to return to her cave and go to bed. Sun tumbles through the air all night, unable to get close enough to the ground to land until he manages to snag hold of a mountain mountain peak. Once he rallies a little, he realizes he actually recognizes the mountain. It's where he fought a completely unrelated wind demon back in episode 3 with the help of the Bodhisattva Ling Ji. Seeing as he's in the neighborhood, he drops by Ling Ji's temple and explains the situation, and Ling Ji is very impressed that Sun managed to stop his flight after a mere 50,000 miles. The winds of the Divine Fan are supposed to blow the victim a full 84,000 miles before they're subjected to the sweet release of gravity once more. Fortunately for Sun Wukong, Ling Ji can actually help him out, since way back in the day, the Buddha gave him two treasures for dealing with wind-related threats. One is the flying dragon staff they already used to defeat the yellow wind demon, but the other is a small pill of wind-arresting elixir that hasn't been used yet. They sew it into Sun's collar for future use and send him on his way. Sun zips back to the cave and hammers on the door, which severely unnerves Princess Iron Fan, who gears up to fight him again. This time, however, the wind-arresting elixir makes Sun completely immune to the fan's wind, startling Princess Iron Fan so much that she bolts back into the cave and seals the door. Having tried and failed the direct combat approach twice now, Sun decides to try the sneaky route and turns into a mole cricket, slides under the door, sees Princess Iron Fan's servants preparing her tea and gets a very clever idea. Oh no, there's Vor in this one. So Sun dives into the tea, 
is promptly swallowed and proceeds to use his highly tactically advantageous position to wail on Princess Iron Fan from the inside. She begs for mercy and offers him the fan, and he kindly accepts her terms, zipping back out of her mouth, snagging the palm leaf fan, and heading back to the gang. Mission accomplished, or so it seems. But as they proceed to the Mountain of Flames and Sun readies the fan, he finds that every swing only seems to make the fires burn hotter. When three swings of the fan make the heat a thousand times more unbearable, the gang have no choice but to retreat and rethink their approach. As they're stewing in their various grievances, the gang is approached by an old man who explains that he's the local deity of the Mountain of Flames. He saw them having difficulties and he'd like to help them out. But as soon as he spots the fan, he realizes the problem. The fan is actually a fake. If Sun wants the real one that'll let him put out the fire for good, he'll probably have to seek out the Bull Demon King himself to figure out how he and Princess Iron Fan have hidden it. Sun asks if the Bull Demon King is responsible for the fire on the Mountain of Flames, and the spirit says that Sun has to promise not to get mad, but the Bull Demon King didn't set the fire, Sun Wukong did. He quickly explains that way back when Sun Wukong wreaked havoc in heaven and got stuck in Lao Tzu's brazier for his troubles, when Sun broke out and overturned the brazier, he dislodged a few flaming heavenly bricks that fell to earth and lodged in this mountain. The mountain spirit says he was actually the brazier's attendant, but after Sun's breakout, he was punished and demoted for his negligence and has been stuck taking care of this burning mountain ever since. But old news aside, the mountain spirit has plenty of fresh and piping hot goss to dish on the Bull Demon King. Apparently, he and Princess Iron Fan are actually separated because the Bull Demon King is hooked up with Princess Jade Countenance, the daughter of a 10,000-year-old fox spirit who died and left behind a massive hoard of treasure, which Princess Jade Countenance offered in full to the Bull Demon King as her dowry if he'd come protect her with his big strong arms. So the Bull Demon King totally ditched Princess Iron Fan and shacked up with Princess Jade Countenance in the cloud-touching cave of the Horde Thunder Mountain. But the Bull Demon King's disastrous love life aside, if Sun Wukong can get the Bull Demon King to tell him how to get the fan, Sun can do three good deeds for the price of one. Let Tripitaka continue his journey to the west, extinguish the flaming mountain that is 100% his fault, and get the spirit of the mountain unbanished from heaven. Sun wastes no time and jets off to Horde Thunder Mountain, where he finds a beautiful young woman who he asks if she can direct him to the Bull Demon King. When he decides he needs a cover story and claims that Princess Iron Fan sent him, the young woman flies into a rage, and Sun realizes immediately that he miscalculated, and this young woman must be the other woman, aka Princess Jade Countenance. Sun gets remarkably pissed at her home-wrecking hijinks, which scares her so much that she bolts, vanishing into the cave and flinging herself at the Bull Demon King so she can beg him to protect her from the terrifying monk his ex-wife sent to their door. This convoluted string of apparently disconnected concepts confuses the Bull Demon King, who heads out tentatively expecting a fight, and is not expecting to find his former blood brother Sun Wukong, who is a picture of politeness as he explains his recent exploits and asks him for his help in acquiring the fan. The Bull Demon King is already pretty pissed right from the jump, but the audacity to ask him for a favor against his own wife is the last straw, and he attacks. He and the Monkey King clash in a truly spectacular battle that is cut short when the Bull Demon King gets a dinner invitation he really can't turn down, so he calls a timeout and zips back to the cave to get ready. Sun is evidently too confused to stop him, but does decide to secretly follow him to the aforementioned dinner party to see if that gives him any leads. The Bull Demon King disappears into a mountain containing a deep lagoon, so Sun turns into a crab and scuttles down after him, where he finds a bubble containing a beautiful underwater coral palace full of all kinds of aquatic animals staffing a huge party for a bunch of dragon spirits, with the Bull Demon King as the special guest of honor. Unfortunately for Sun, the old dragon spirit has a sharp eye for interlopers and immediately notices the crab out of place, but Sun quickly concocts a cover story about how he's just a humble country crab who don't know nothing about their fancy palace ways, so he manages to escape the fate of crab flogging, but is still kicked out of the party, which is when he remembers he can shapeshift and decides to just steal the Bull Demon King's ride and pretend to be him. He flies back to Jade Cloud Mountain, perfectly disguised as the Bull Demon King, where he is of course greeted with the highest honors by Princess Iron Fan, who very politely asks him what could have possessed him to leave his hot new concubine and return to her humble abode. Sun is like, Uh, well you see, I've heard tell that the devilishly handsome Sung Wukong is on the hunt for the palm leaf fan. I just want to make sure you're keeping the treasure safe. You never know when he might strike. Princess Iron Fan tells him that Sun Wukong has already struck, but not to worry, she fooled him with a fake and he'll never find the real one. Sun asks where she's keeping the real one, you know, for security reasons, but Princess Iron Fan has held off long enough and declares it's time to celebrate his long-awaited return by partying hard and flirting even harder, leaving Sun deeply uncomfortable as he quickly processes the ramifications of doing his espionage in the form of this woman's husband. He finally gets her back on track on the where exactly is the fan question and she responds by spitting out a really tiny one. 
Sun stares at it in abject confusion for a minute before Princess Iron Fan explains that as he knows, obviously the fan is hidden in its travel size mode, until he touches the specific thread on the handle and recites the spell that'll change it into its full-sized form just like so. Sun thanks her for her help, drops the illusion, suggests she dial back on the drinking a little bit, and then bolts, leaving Princess Iron Fan once again absolutely furious. Sun, meanwhile, busts out the spell she told him and makes the fan big, and then quickly realizes he never learned how to make it small again, so he just slings it over his shoulder and slowly starts heading back to the gang. Meanwhile, back at the dragon party, the Bull Demon King realizes that someone stole his ride, recalls the suspicious country crab, and puts two and two together to make Sun Wukong. He heads straight for Palm Leaf Cave and finds Princess Iron Fan in completely furious disarray, and borrows her swords to go kick Sun Wukong's ass a little bit. However, when he sees Sun lugging the fan, he realizes he can't risk a direct confrontation for fear of getting blown over the horizon for 84,000 miles, and instead decides to take a page out of the Monkey King's book and turns himself into Pigsy. So he meanders up to Sun Wukong and is like, Oh, hey, buddy! You were taking so long, Tripitaka got worried that the devilishly handsome lady killer, the Bull Demon King, might have been giving you a hard time. Sun naturally regales him with tales of his cunning victory, and when Pigsy offers to carry that ponderously huge fan for him, Sun agrees, presumably realizing just a second too late how out of character it is for Pigsy to volunteer to do anything. Pigsy reveals his true form and swings the fan at Sun, but the windproof elixir is still protecting him, so instead they just fight normally. Meanwhile, Tripitaka is really getting sick of the superheated fire mountain and is actually actually worried about what could possibly be taking Sun Wukong so long, so he sends the real Pigsy after him with the Spirit of the Mountain of Flames to guide his way. Sure enough, they quickly hear sounds of commotion, and Pigsy zips down to help out with the fight. Monkey is pissed right out the gate, but quickly reins it in and tells Pigsy he's not really mad at him, he's mad at the Bull Demon King for pretending to be him. And Pigsy is so furious at having his identity stolen that he attacks the Bull Demon King in a frenzy that actually knocks him onto the back foot. The Bull Demon King tries to retreat, but his way is barred by the Spirit of the Mountain of Flames leading an army of ghosts that I assume he borrowed from the set of Return of the King, and with the Bull Demon King cornered, he has no choice but to keep fighting. The battle eventually takes them back to Horde Thunder Mountain, where Princess Jade Countenance sends out all their guards to back up the Bull Demon King, which manages to overwhelm Monkey and Pigsy by sheer numbers, letting the Bull Demon King finally retreat. But that doesn't slow things down for long, as after Sun gets Pigsy up to speed and gives a little motivational speech to the troops, the duo smash down the cave doors and the battle begins again. But this time, the Bull Demon King tries another bold strategy for running away. He abandons his armor and weapons and transforms into a swan to escape in the confusion. Sun spots him with his special eyes and sends the others to clear out the cave while he engages the Bull Demon King in a good old-fashioned shapeshifter showdown. The duo battle through an assortment of forms, going from birds to beasts, until finally the Bull Demon King enters his true form, a gigantic pure white bull that is fully two miles long. Sun responds by turning himself into his own mega version, and the two engage in a literal kaiju battle, and it rules. This cataclysmic clash of colossi alerts every god in the region that some sh** is going down and they all join in to help out the beatdown, which quickly overwhelms the Bull Demon King, and he reverts to travel size to jet back to Palm Leaf Cave. Sun pursues with the other gods, soon joined by Pigsy and that ghost army who have successfully cleared out Horde Thunder Mountain of bad guys. They reach Palm Leaf Cave, and Pigsy gets a turn at smashing the door down, while inside, the Bull Demon King gives Princess Iron Fan the Palm Leaf Fan for safekeeping. At this point, she's fully done with this and tells him to just give the Monkey King the fan so he'll leave them alone, but the Bull Demon King is too hopped up on vengeance to listen and gears up with her swords again to fight in yet another kick-ass battle. But inevitably, he gets tired out again and turns to run. But this time, his escape is barred by four serious big names. The four heavenly kings, Buddhist devas that guard the cardinal directions, block his escape at every turn, having been deployed by the Buddha himself to make him calm the hell down. The Bull Demon King finds himself well and truly surrounded by Buddhist warriors and celestial generals. Fleeing into the sky doesn't help, since he runs smack into Devaraja Lee and Prince Nada, who've been sent to arrest him on order of the Jade Emperor. He responds by turning back into a kaiju and throwing hands with Devaraja Lee in yet another kick ass epic battle. Prince Nada reminds everyone of that one time he turned into a three-faced, six-armed kaiju of his own by doing that again, hopping on the bull's back and immediately slicing off its head. Unfortunately, the Bull Demon King has more in common with the Monkey King than they gave him credit for, because the loss of his head is a minor inconvenience at most and he promptly grows it back, a process that repeats like ten more times until Nada clocks that this isn't working and tries a new tactic by hooking his flaming wheel over the bull's horns. Having a massive on-fire hoop stuck to his head does not make the Bull Demon King happy, and he tries to transform to a escape, but is locked out of shapeshifting by a magic mirror Devaraja Lee has prepared for just such an occasion. The Bull Demon King finally surrenders, and they tie him up and lead him back to the cave, where he asks Princess Iron Fan to surrender the Palm Leaf Fan to Sun Wukong. Princess Iron Fan emerges, uncharacteristically plainly dressed and ready to surrender without complaint, having done some soul searching and concluding she's really not happy with where her life is at right now. She hands over the fan, and they all head over to Tripitaka, who is a little startled when the entire army of heaven rolls up. Sun swings the fan three times, summoning a storm, and finally 
putting out the fire. The Heavenly Host leaves with the Bull Demon King in tow, and Princess Iron Fan asks Sun if maybe she can have her fan back now since she'd like to use it in pursuit of self-cultivation. Sun is a little surprised to realize that she's quite sincere and has actually already worked her way up to having a real human body, which is something that almost none of his enemies have had. But it does remind him of one important question. How can he make sure the fire never comes back? She tells him all he has to do is fan the mountain 49 times, and after he gets through that last bit of tedium, he returns her fan, because he is a monkey of his word. Princess Iron Fan leaves to begin a life of moderation and self-cultivation, and apparently eventually succeeds, which is really cool. With the mountain of flames extinguished and the way forward clear at last, our heroes can finally continue their journey to the west. The Monkey King's destined battle with one he once called brother has been concluded. Could this be the end of their trials and tribulations, or will there be more battles yet to face before they set foot in the Thunderclap Monastery? Find out next time on Journey to the West.